My guest today is Don Worley, a seasoned producer and a SAG actor. Now, he was a stand-up comic for years, appearing at comedy clubs and corporate events around the country. Now, he is also one of the top attorneys in the country, and the show Power of Attorney, Don Worley, is based on him and his firm. Now, he is the chief storyteller in charge of each production at Second Chance Pictures. Now, Don has recently starred in the leading role of the new film, Time for Sunset, a thriller about a hitman on his last job. Now, he is also the COO of Brand In Entertainment, a company that provides brand collaborations with television and film productions. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome attorney at law and star of both Power of Attorney and Time for Sunset, Don Worley, to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're very, very welcome. How does an attorney become an actor? Uh, well, I think it was an actor becoming an attorney in my case. I uh, actually have an acting theater undergraduate degree. And as you said earlier, I did some stand-up comedy across the nation. And I thought, what job could I have where I could use those skills of acting? And I thought trial lawyer would be great. Well, did the stand-up comedy lead you into acting? Um, you know, I started off more thinking I was going to be a traditional actor, even in the theater. And I was telling someone recently the story. I'm in New York right now. And I, when I was a young man and studying theater, I was like, I'm going to perform on Broadway, thinking I would be in some type of Broadway show in my future. And um, I, I left the path of theater, but I remember one day I was doing stand-up comedy in a comedy club, uh, Caroline's on Broadway was the name of it. And it was actually on Broadway, a comedy club. And in that moment, I stopped and I realized, you know what? I am performing on Broadway. Just not the way I thought it was going to be. <laughs> well, has, has acting and comedy helped you win cases in the courtroom? Yes, it does. I mean, the biggest hurdle as a for a trial lawyers to get comfortable in front of a jury and i obviously had that covered uh being very comfortable and also storytelling i mean if uh i'm stealing this from a robert mckee book a little bit called story but you know even in the office you have the person at the cooler telling about their day and everyone's around the water cooler just listening to every word the person says because they're a storyteller and then you have other people that try to tell you a story and your mind drifts off to other things because they are not a storyteller. So I think the acting background helped prepare me to be a storyteller, to be able to tell a story to the jury. You know, being an actor and a lawyer, and if you're in a courtroom, does your skills as an actor help you to read the other side or to play off of possible uh, you know, whatever they, whatever they're doing about their case. Uh, yes, it helps me read and try to read the jury and also play off what they do. I have to be a little careful with the stand-up comedy side um, because you can say things that are inappropriate uh, and get in trouble with the judge and uh, as well. But the acting part, yes, it helps you play off of what the other side is doing. Well, how do you balance being both? Because I know, you know, lawyer being a lawyer can definitely be a daily uh, profession and acting is not daily uh, for some. I know it's very rare. Probably what one percent of SAG actors can actually claim being an actor full time. Yeah, correct. I mean, very few of them even make an average of minimum wage um, over a year period. So I am fortunate in that department, but I had. Uh, lunch today with a lawyer in New York and we had that very same conversation about shooting the show because you know we shoot 10 hour days but I said well yeah but I don't shoot 10 hours I mean so I work but I have my schedule and they say you're going to shoot at this time and there's also you know as you know from doing a show doing the show is very little time they set up they move the cameras around they move the lights around they do rehearsals so I'm able to do work in between the time that I'm not actually shooting. So it does take planning. Obviously, if I have a jury trial, I mark that off. Or if I'm shooting a movie for 30 days, then um, I mark that off the lawyer side. Uh, and I am very fortunate to be surrounded by people smarter than me at the law firm that can handle anything that comes up. So, so what do they think about you being an actor? I mean, and you're a movie star now. <laughs> oh, they 
they think it's fun. They came out too. We had a premiere for Time for Sunset out at Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. So a lot of them came out to have fun and and have the experience. So they, they think it's fun um, and they support it in any way they can. So when did you when did you start doing your TV series called Power of Attorney? Um, I guess about three years ago, we shot the first one in Texas um, and it went on Discovery Channel and then now it's on Amazon Prime and Tubi. But then we shot the second season in Vegas uh, and the plan now is to shoot season three in Los Angeles. Now, is this a reality series or is it a true to life drama? I would say unscripted. Um, when they approached me about it, I didn't really want to do what's quote reality because I didn't want to throw my client's private information out there on TV to everyone. Um, I know you do on shows like Judge Judy, but I mean, really both sides win on those shows because they, whoever wins the show pays it. So they don't really have anything to lose. So in that situation, but in mine, it, it's, it's stories based on loosely on cases that I've had or my friends have had or they're of national headlines. Uh, but they are real lawyers, real courtroom, and real juries that make the decision, and the real experts that are on the show. So it's it's more of a show, an unscripted show about the process of taking a client's case from beginning to the courtroom. Well, being a trial lawyer, uh, for a, a lot of us that don't really understand law, uh, what is a trial lawyer? Lawyer is it mostly just civil cases, or is it murder trials? Uh, well, actually, if you're gonna the ones that go to the trial the most are criminal lawyers. They go every month because, you know, they go to trial on criminal cases. Civil cases just get settled out of court. The majority of the cases don't even ever see a courtroom. They only go to courtroom if the two sides can't agree on a fair and reasonable settlement amount for both sides. And then you have to go ask a jury of your client's peers to make the decision for us. Well, so I guess if you settle out of court uh, with many of the civil cases, it does uh, give you more time for film. <laughs> That's true. It gives us more time for film. Uh, and But the trials are not, you know, sometimes they can be long, but not like a murder trial that can be a month long. Or the trials you see on TV or in movies are typically criminal trials and not civil trials. And they're a little different. Yeah, you know, I know that uh, the series Suits is one of the most popular shows on streaming now. Uh, and one of the repeated storylines that they have is to use mock trials. How effective are they in preparation of a real life trial? Oh, that's what my show is all about is basically, it's not even about trials. It finishes each episode with a mock trial, but I don't think you can be a trial lawyer without going to mock trials because you don't know what a jury is going to do. I cannot imagine going to the courthouse and trying a case for the first time and looking at a jury and asking them for a dollar amount without having had multiple focus groups tell me what they think the case is worth. Well, I mean, that does make sense. And, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure you've seen episodes of Suits. How close is that to the real thing? That's all. Yes, it's all very close. I mean, even on our show, the, you know, the jurors or, or the focus group guy, people that come in to be on the show on the jury, they argue in the, in the jury room, just like a jury would, they treat it. It's, it's a human phenomenon, but if you watch it, they really get in there and they get tempered and they argue about the cases. If it's a real case at stake, forgetting it's all television and they're on TV, but they argue their positions and it's a very complicated matter, but yeah, I wouldn't without taking it to practice and seeing what, uh, I'll say civilians, people that aren't lawyers think about it because I think like a lawyer, cause I've been doing it for 25 years and I want to see what a person in the community thinks about the case and without knowing what's important to people that are going to be on the jury and what they think the value is. I don't see how you could possibly try it to a jury because if you don't, if you leave questions unanswered that are important to them, or uh, you talk too much about things that are not important to them, um, you're going to lose the jury. And then if you ask for too much money, you're going to lose some votes that you might've had. And if you ask for too little money, they'll come up to you afterwards and said, we would have given you 10 million if you would have asked for it. And that's not good for you and your client standing next to you either. So it's the, I think it's the most important part of the process. Mock trials. That is. Boy, trying to figure out a, a settlement amount really must be very, very difficult. 
Well, that, the only way I can do it and I've been able to do it is what juries, focus groups and mock juries tell me what it's worth because that's what a jury would give you. And then you balance with the client having money today as opposed to having money years from now because even if you go down and win at the courthouse, they do the, they file an appeal, which takes two to three years to reach a decision. Um, so it's it's money today because most of these clients, they can't work because they've been injured. So they need money now for just your basic bills that we take for granted. Um, so they need money now and also you balance uh, what is a fair settlement to them now where they have cash in their hand now and also the risk of going to trial because just because five focus groups told you one thing doesn't mean the next one is going to tell you something different. Yeah, I guess there's always a surprise when you could actually come out with nothing. True. You can, and you can have people on your jury that just take charge and convince the others to vote at their will. So how, with your TV series, Power of Attorney, uh, what's, what's been the, uh, what's the response like? Uh, you know, it's been very positive. Um, I, I was shared, the production company shared some of the data and it seemed like the Midwest, there was, you know, had a lot of popularity. And then uh, I didn't really know, you know, what the demographic demographics were, but I do remember I was in Vegas at a lawyer event. Um, it was called Club Zook, where they have a DJ. It's inside of Resorts World. And I was up there with some lawyers and a group of young guys, I'd say early 20s, uh, asked my friend, is that Don Worley? And he said, yeah. And apparently they were just graduated from law school and it was their first year as lawyers. They were all going out to celebrate. And so they had watched the show. So I guess a lot of law students watched the show to kind of learn the process. Wow, that's pretty cool. So um, <laughs> at least law students are watching it. There you go. Well, I want to talk to you about your brand new movie. You're now you're the lead actor in Time for Sunset. Uh, I've watched the whole film. Uh, what was it like being the lead actor in a major motion picture? Um, it's not my first one. I did one uh, probably 10 years ago where Danny Trejo was in the movie with me, the guy that's known as Machete. Uh, but it's called Pastor Shepherd, and it was based on this televangelist character I created on YouTube uh, on a show called called Prayer Hour, where I was a it was a uh, I guess a, a satire on uh, televangelists that are only interested in money and not interested in uh, anything religious. Uh, so I did that show and it turned into a movie. And so I was the lead actor in that, that one as well, which is about the same shooting schedule, about 25 days. So this one is a little more challenging in, in that not only I was the only actor, the other actor was on the phone most of the time. So we did have on the set someone sitting there reading lines, but there was no one face to face acting with and feeding off their emotions. They were just basically reading lines in a chair. So it was a little more challenging for as from the actor side. See, I like films where there is there's one main lead character and a lot of times where they're literally acting, but they don't have anyone to bounce their acting off of. There's not another character in the room or in the scene. It, it reminds me a lot of Die Hard, where Bruce Willis, most of his scenes were by himself. So he right. had to muster up the emotions the the tense drama the facial expressions and so those are the things that i really love to see because to me i think it really stretches an actor and since this was this role was challenging to you did it seem to stretch your acting skills oh yes it was very exhausting especially for the long days that we we're shooting but but yes like i said my uh my scenes were just by myself there was someone sitting in a chair reading lines but I shot my lines and had to act without anyone to feed off of. And then same for the voiceover actor who was very good. And he was, he's in New York and he did all of his in a studio in New York in front of a microphone. And then of course they edited it all together in post-production to where we're on the phone together the entire time. But yes, it was, it was challenging to act by yourself. And, and I've learned these, uh, the films are called contained thrillers. That's what I've learned like the die hard and this movie time for sunset and where they, take place mostly in one location well, and the actor is alone a lot. Well, in this film, 
was it on a uh, film set or was it in, in an actual hotel room? This one was in a film set. They built a hotel room at a little studio uh, south of Austin, Texas. And so this allowed us to shoot, you know, 12 hour days without interruption. Um, the hard part about film production in real locations like a hotel is stopping for noise, people coming in and out of their hotel rooms, sirens of police cars or ambulances going by or sounds of horns honking if you're in New York City outside your window in New York and the, uh, the hotel. But so it was it gave us a, a, a more controlled environment to be able to shoot uh, more efficiently. Well, you know, I, I really like the film because I love I love thrillers, but I love hitmen type films <laughs> because they're because they're the main character and either some of them or towards the end of their career, they really want to get out of that line of work because now the emotional part of the job is setting in and your character had a little bit of that emotional part because uh, your character had, had a wife and child. Correct. Yeah. I wanted to just be a normal person and wanted to get out and be a normal person. And, uh, uh, and thought that he, you know, one of the lines was, so you think he'll just go to Disneyland and coach sports and, my character was like, yeah, that's kind of the idea. <laughs> well, did you have fun shooting that movie? It did. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was, you know, we were doing, it was brutal because, you know, we'd shoot 12, you know, six 12 hour days and then one day off. And so I would get up in the morning, go to the coffee shop and do, I was one of the, I was the writer. I did the re rewrite on the screenplay. So, but we still had to tweak some things almost on a daily basis. So I would get up at five or 6 a.m., go to a coffee shop and do the rewrites for scenes of that day that we had to tweak based on other changes that were made and then shoot for 12 hours and then after work do my do some lawyer stuff, catch up on emails and lawyer stuff. So it was I didn't sleep much that month. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I don't I'm not going to give any spoiler alerts because I want everybody to see this film. Uh, but you real ladies and gentlemen, you really have to pay attention as this film moves along and you need to mentally keep little notes because there's these little things that go on in this film. And especially for, for me, Don, I had to really uh, focus because it's the ending. I actually had to replay the ending a few times to try to put all of that together. And I'm almost <laughs> kind of left hanging. Are we going to see a sequel to this one? <laughs> I don't know if we will or not, but yeah, that was sort of, uh, I guess the point of the ending is for you to interpret however you wanted it to end. If, you know, if, if you're someone that loves happy endings, it's a happy ending. Everybody's okay. And if you're the one that likes more of a, a darker ending, then you can interpret it that way as well. And I can see where that can happen with this film. Now, where can my audience uh, see time for sunset? Well, it's my understanding that it's going to go to AMC theaters first, but, you know, I'm, uh, I get little bits and pieces from uh, the distributor and then it will be streaming on one of the streaming platforms that everybody has in their on their home. You know, either like my TV shows on Amazon Prime to be, I'm sure it would be there at some point, maybe even a Netflix or some of the others that are prop. Uh, there's competitors coming uh, online every day for online streaming. Well, uh, this is. <clears throat> And ladies and gentlemen, this is a film that when it comes to the theater, you need to go check out Time for Sunset. So if you like thrillers, if you like hitman movies like I do, this is really going to be right up your alley. Now, Don, I understand that you are COO of a company called Brand In Entertainment. What is that company all about? Uh, it's a company that was started years ago. Um, and what the founder wanted to do, Rolf... Uh, that's his name, but he wanted to marry brands with the entertainment industry. So if you wanted to promote your product, then he would work on integrating your product into a movie or a film. I mean, a movie or a television show. And I mean, one good example, he did uh, a movie with Mark Wahlberg um, called Lone Survivor, I believe. And uh, the military, uh, it's my understanding, mostly use Glocks as the gun they use, but Beretta paid money to have their brand used in the movie and discussed 
their brand Beretta. So if you're watching a show like um, a TV show and they show a Dodge Ram emblem on the back of a pickup for a long period of time, it's because Dodge Ram paid to be integrated and in, Dodge paid to be integrated into that TV show. So it's a, it's a way, it's a win-win for uh, the industry because they give you budget towards making your movie or TV show. So you may not be watching that TV show or that film if the money had not come from that branding company. So it makes, it makes productions possible and it also gets the branding out um, for the manufacturer of their brand. And it can be anything. It can be clothing. It can be alcohol. It can be automobiles, guns, like we talked about. So it's basically marrying uh, the branding, the brand industry like you would normally have been here in New York City with Hollywood. You know, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the James Bond films, the ones with Daniel Craig, that the majority of those films were actually financed with brand integration uh, from anywhere from Aston Martin to BMW to Omega watches that the majority of those yeah. budgets were paid for uh, with advertising. And of course, as you know, it, it becomes product placement within those films uh, with, with this company. You know, I, I talked to so many filmmakers and it's always the funding part that is the biggest nightmare of either making a film or even a, a feature or a short film and even producing a TV series, which I kind of know from experience, but um, does this, does Brandon Entertainment, does it make this process easier? Yes, it can finance. Sometimes uh, we've done 100% of the budget. I mean, you, you have to be a little creative um, and then you may have to change some of the script to write in a brand. And there's some people that are, I'm an artist, I'm not changing my script to put in a brand, but no one's going to see your vision if you don't sell it. I mean, it, it can be as simple as, uh, you know, hand me that 11, that bottle of 11 vodka over there to, you know, and someone hands you that and you take a drink out of it. It can be as simple as adding something like that into your script, but you know, some people don't want to do that and that's fine. Then they don't get the money. <laughs> but if you, if you're flexible and you can put brands in the movie to help pay for it, um, I mean, it's easy. You already had a scene with a guy drinking vodka. So why not just find someone to pay for that scene and just say the name of the vodka? It's really, to me, I see it's a no brainer. It's a win win. It is, it is a no brainer. And, you know, a lot, you know, I was thinking uh, this morning how every television series is literally financed through advertising. You know, advertising on the network is paying for all the productions for all of those shows that that we want to watch and then uh, even going to streaming. If if uh, for from brand in entertainment, what is involved if a filmmaker wants to talk to you about brand integration to help fund their project? What, what do they need to do? Well, it's easy to find the website. It's Brand In Entertainment. I can Google it and find us and just reach out. But, um, you know, there's there's an agreement that says, you know, we basically get commission on what we bring in. That's how we get paid because really it's sort of an ad agency model. You know, we get a commission what we bring in. We do request a little advance, sort of a um, engagement fee. And the reason is, is because there's been a lot of people that don't end up making their projects for various reasons. Um, and you know that from being in the entertainment industry, there's so many movies that they have great ideas, they get started and then it all falls apart. Well, brand in did a lot of work matching brands with the product and talking in, talking brands into being in the project. And then you don't end up getting paid because the person, their, their money, the rest of their money fell through or, you know, that an actor got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever reason that just falls through it, no, at no fault to brand in. So to keep the lights on and to help weed out those that are not serious, uh, there is a little retainer fee that gets credited against commission, but that's the process. Well, it makes sense. I mean, they need to put a little bit of skin in the game if they're very serious about getting their project made. Correct. And if you're making a million dollar project, what's $5,000? If you're not willing to put 5,000 bucks in, then you're probably not going to round up, do the work that's required to, to round up a million dollars. 
Well, for you, because you've been not only just an actor, I mean, you're, you're writing some of these screenplays. And in the last year, we've already seen, what, two or three strikes in the entertainment business. Now that the strikes, for the most part, have been settled, uh, has it changed the industry at all? Um, I don't, the strikes were sort of a result of a change in the world. Um, uh, everyone's really afraid of AI, I think in any industry, um, from fast food workers to union workers to, you know, actors and writers, because if chat, a chat bot or chat, uh, I can't remember the name of the AI writing software. Yeah, I, I think it's a it chat uh, GPT. I think that's what right. it's called. So, so if chat, chat BT, you, uh, a producer can punch in what they want a screenplay to be about and, and, and chat GPT writes it for them, then you don't need to pay a WGA screenwriter $100,000 to do it. Um, and if you can create an actor with AI uh, to play a role in a movie, then you don't have to pay a SAG actor to to play that role. So I think a lot of these, um, a lot of the strikes and a lot of the, it arose out of the fear of the unknown of AI. And I think you and I know it, AI is never going to replace actors. We watch movies and television because we want to be moved and we want to see real people doing real things and not, I mean, I know animated films are animated films and I watch those also, I have two boys that are grown up now, but I watched all the Disney movies and all the Pixar movies myself and enjoyed them. Uh, but that's the one thing. But we watch movies for the actors. In fact, I mean, even today in, in Hollywood, you say, I'm putting together money for this movie. The question is, who's in it? You know, and if it's an AI actor, then no one's going to be asking who's in it. Well, yeah, because um, I read the other day, I think it was either in Variety or Hollywood Reporter. Sony plans on making AI films. And the my thought was, okay, you've already seen all the guidelines from uh, the Director's Guild, the Writer's Guild, and the Actor's Guild. What loopholes did they see for them to create full-blown AI films? And I, from what I understand with the SAG strike, I don't think the AI situation has been completely resolved. No, it hasn't, because you can't say you can never use AI, uh, because everyone is going to be using AI. So it's a balance. They're just, you know, it's self-preservation. I mean, writers want to make a living and actors want to make a living, and it's difficult enough already without the introduction of AI. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I see these uh, articles and I see people saying, oh, yeah, you can just type this in and... I mean, even Tyler Perry, uh, he stopped. I be, I'm, I'm trying to think what the amount was. I think it, it was a $800 million expansion studio uh, expansion project that he put a stop to because he was in great fear of AI, but at the same time understanding that if you just have to type in, hey, I need a, I need a cabin in the woods, um, on the north side of Arizona, it creates the instant set for you. But I think as an audience, we're going to notice the difference. It's not going to be, to me, it's not going to be that real. <laughs> right. It's getting more and more real, especially in, you know, 2D. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't think creative writing or acting is going to go anywhere because I think that that's what makes entertainment entertainment now for you do you uh are you the main screenwriter uh for most of the films that you're in uh well that's that's uh i wouldn't say the screenwriter i do the rewrites so i've been really good over my career of doing of writing original three to five minute comedies pieces in other words like stand-up comedy a three to five minute bit or those little YouTube videos I did as Pastor Shepherd, the televangelist, those were three to five minutes on YouTube. But sitting down at a blinking cursor on a computer and writing a 120 page screenplay, never gonna happen. I just couldn't do it. I had ideas, but I'd always have to hire a writer. 
Now, once a project's done, it's easy for me to dig into it and tweak it. And I don't want to say make it better because I don't, I'm sure the writer thought it was wonderful the way it was, but um, I like going in and, and changing, making changes. And, um, you know, like, uh, for instance, in Time for Sunset, without giving too much away, the original screenplay had no connection between the two assassins. And so I did the rewrite to make there a connection between the two assassins. Uh, it was just before a young guy not going out and an older guy wanting to go out. And I thought it added a level of, of drama to connect the two in a way. And so I did the rewrite to connect the two assassins. Um, and in this next movie, uh, well, I'm growing a beard because I'm doing a, a brand in movie. That's where I play a homeless person. Uh, running a scam. It's called Tramps Like Us, and we shoot that in July in, in L.A., and uh, the day we finish shooting, I'm shaving this off, just so you know. Um, but the next movie is called The Tempering. I did the rewrite on that, and I changed it, the lead from a male to a female because I thought it really, uh, in my opinion, uh, made it a more exciting project. So what part are you going to play in that film? Uh, I play a supporting role in The Tempering. I play a uh, uh, it's called man in the black suit, but is a mysterious stranger that comes to a small town, which I think we're going to, the plan is to shoot it in Savannah because uh, Savannah is actually a, a client of brand ends that provides money. If you integrate their city and signs of Savannah and scenes of Savannah. And then of course, Georgia has tax breaks. Yeah, they, they really, really do. So as a filmmaker, uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand the tax break situ situation with film commissions. Uh, for you at the moment, uh, what are some of the best states to film in because of the film commissions? Well, Georgia's been a good one, but the problem is Marvel went in there and spent a billion dollars. And so you have a lot of tax credits that you couldn't sell there for a while, but uh, it's getting good now. But yeah, Georgia's been really good. And New York is always very, very filmmaker friendly. And I don't mean just in the city. I mean, upstate New York and lots of places. Now, of course, California, I mean, they're, they're obviously film friendly, but their, you know, their tax plan wasn't as aggressive as other states. And also there was rumors of some filmmakers receiving IOUs because California didn't have the money. So, uh, but, which is not a good surprise for uh, making a movie. And, in Texas, you know, it's, I'm from Texas originally, so I still live there a lot. So not to talk bad about my state, but they say they're film friendly, and but they weren't offering great incentives. And sometimes they're having problems with it. Like it was 25 percent rebate after you spent the money. But then they shot the movie Machete there and there was a clause in there that if it didn't reflect Texas in a good light, it was canceled. So the governor decided that it didn't reflect Texas in a good light. So canceled the. Uh, the tax credit. So it was sort of anti uh, filmmaker in my opinion, but so there's, there's been other great States like New Mexico and there's, there's a, a list that it changes annually, but those have been some of the best States. So the budgets actually change on an annual basis. Well, their tax, they have to vote on what tax rebates they're giving every year for their, their as they do their budgets every year. So, you know, it, it may be 40% tax rebate if you spend, you know, if you spend $3 million, you get up to 40% of your budget rebated back to you. If you come and spend it all in that state, that may be that this year and next year, it might be lowered to 30% depending on who's in charge. Well, I knew Georgia was probably number one when it came to filming. I mean, The Walking Dead, like you said, Marvel, of course, whatever Tyler Perry's doing at the moment on, on his studio lots. You know, I've heard the, the rise of New Mexico, which you brought up, because I hear that uh, they're really understanding that they have the landscape uh, and the space right. for films. California has always been that hit and miss situation, which boggles my mind that California should be probably the best place to film, but they don't make it easy. And New York is probably one of the most, like you said, one of the most generous when it comes to the film commissions. So, uh, uh, and also they're just, they're friend. I mean, they're just, they're pro filmmaker. They'll roll, you know, lay out the red carpet for you where LA, they're like, no, you can't shoot here. The last people tore everything up. So 
but New York is just very filmmaker friendly, roll out the red carpet. Yeah. And I think too, you know, with New York, there's so many different areas to film in for different looks. I talked to a few filmmakers not too long ago who filmed in Buffalo because Buffalo has areas in which goes back to where you can make it look like the 1915 or 1920s and, and pull off um, that look very easily without even trying. All right. All right. People think New York City, but there's Albany, there's small towns, upstate New York. There's any landscape you want, you can find it in New York. I mean, obviously, you have to plan around the weather because the... Uh, Upstate New York can be brutal during the winter. It's like Buffalo. Um, but you have to plan around your shooting schedule around that unless you're shooting all indoors. But but yes, it's very filmmaker friendly. Well, with some of the, the brand new uh, upcoming projects that you have that you just mentioned, how long did it take to go from inception to uh, getting it scheduled to start filming? Well, each one's different. Uh, Tramps Like Us moved kind of pretty fast. Um the tempering I've had for a long time and I did the rewrite several years ago and then came back, revisited and wrote it again. So it's been about, it's probably been a seven year project, but, um, some of these just the shoot, you know, the writer finishes it and it goes to production. So it's, it just depends production to production. Well, so with the two new upcoming projects for you, uh, what else is on the horizon for you? I have a few other films that, through brand in, I'm playing myself, attorney Don Worley. So um, I have several movies this year that I'm, they needed a lawyer in their movie. So I get to be the lawyer and uh, they say we have, uh, they say my name, attorney Don Worley. So it's sort of an acting slash branding opportunity. Well, you can't beat that. Right. That's a win-win for me. That's, that's it. Hey, Don, I want to thank you so much for uh, dropping by and, sharing a bit of your career as well as, uh, well, power of attorney and where is it and what, which is the next season going to be shot in LA, as you said? That's my understanding. Um, so th that we're going to shoot it in LA and then it's going to be on several other different platforms as well yet to be announced. So it's going to be picked up other places too. Right now, Amazon prime and Tubi, but it'll be on other platforms as well. All right. And ladies and gentlemen, you got to check out, go to Amazon Prime, check out Power of Attorney, Don Worley. And we're going to let you know when Time uh, to Sunset is going to be available at AMC and also on streaming. So be prepared for that. So we're going to give that a big, great shout out from Bondon Cinema. But it, it's a movie you're going to have to see. I loved it. You're going to love it. And Don, again, I want to thank you for dropping by and sharing not only some lawyer stuff with us but also filmmaking and uh your your new upcoming films yes thanks for being here i love your show thanks man thank you so much and ladies and gentlemen hey you can catch all the replays of our interviews with top film directors producers and screenwriters as well as actors and more on bond on cinema we're available on youtube as well as a dozen audio platforms such as itunes and spotify so feel free to subscribe to any of those or all of them so I want to thank you for watching and listening. And as for me, I'm either going to see you at the movies or from the red carpet.